God's word is awesome, isn't it? You'd all agree because you're all believers and I'm putting you on the spot. But it is awesome. It, it's just amazing. It blows me away, just the practicality of the word of God and the, the reality of it being alive. I don't know if you understand that. It's alive. The Bible tells us that it, it is alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews 7, I believe. And it's just amazing when you read it, it just it just like penetrates your heart and, and you're just moved by it. At least I am. And, and it's just an awesome thing to be able to have the words of God himself in, in book form. Uh, amazing thing. And, and to give us the stories and the examples and the principles that are all there for life and everything that pertains to life and godliness, as Paul said. And if we just read it and study it and apply it to our lives... Um, we would have less trouble in our lives. You know, the Lord is probably the most perfect gentleman in all of the world. He, he never forces his will on us. He, he never forces us to do anything. Uh, he's a gentleman. He, he doesn't like to coerce, coerce, coerce people. You know, he, he doesn't like to force them. He wants it to happen from love. That, that we give our hearts to him, our lives, that we would give our attention to him, our praise, our worship, uh, coming here. It's all because we love him and we care about him and we have this relationship with him. Not a religion, because it isn't a religion. The apostles, before they met Jesus, had religion. They were a part of the religious system. They knew the stories, you know, the Old Testament, Genesis and Exodus and the Noah story and Moses and, and we're the children of Israel and God's favors on us. And so they knew all of that. And then all of a sudden, Jesus comes into the scene. A, a, a literal human being that they could touch, that they could see, they could behold. And, and they started doing that very thing. And they could listen to every word that he, he said. And they were connected to him they were drawn to him and now they would sit with him and eat with him and talk with him and and, and listen to him as he was debating other people you know it, that's a relationship right that's what we do here we talk with each other we eat with each other we debate over things we even disagree over things you know that's a relationship and so jesus says now i've, I've come to destroy and or, or to put aside the law and now I'm come to fulfill it, and it's now by grace and having a relationship with me. And so now the disciples were no longer thinking of the stories, they were thinking of Jesus. They weren't thinking of the Ten Commandments, they were thinking of Jesus. And they were thinking of the man that they walked with, the man that they touched, the man that they behold. That was their relationship, that was their connection. And so when the religious leaders saw them, they, they just looked at him and said, Boy, these guys are uneducated men, but we can see that they've been with Jesus. They've been with Jesus because they sound just like him. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ. But God doesn't force that on us at all. He doesn't make us do things. He wants us to do them from our hearts. We make choices. And sometimes those choices will either draw us to God or they will separate us from God. That's, again, I, I refer back to First John. Those first four verses is dealing with eternal life. But the next verses on through the rest of the chapter is dealing with our fellowship with God. And if you say you have fellowship with God and yet you're walking in darkness, you're lying. You're not having fellowship with God. It doesn't say you're not a believer. It just says you're not having fellowship with God. And there's a difference between darkness or evil and light. There definitely is. What is darkness? We can define that. What is evil? We, evil, we can define it. It's the absence of good. It's the absence of God's word and having that relationship with him. And when we put other things before God, then we're walking in darkness and we don't have fellowship with him. That's where you find the children of Israel, Judah, um, Zedekiah, the last king of Israel. They don't have fellowship with God at all. God has to now minister to them through a prophet, Jeremiah. And unfortunately, it, it is a message of separation because of their choices. See, God gives us free will, and we get to choose who we want to have relationships, who we want to be a fellowshipping with and, and, and 
creating a life with, where we want to go, what we want to do. Those are all choices that we get to have. And God gives us that ability to make those choices. And he doesn't force us to make certain choices in our lives. But he hopes that when you get to know him and you read his word and you figure out who he is and and, and what he enjoys and, and how he enjoys us as fellowship, then you start making the right choices so that you can maintain that fellowship with God. But he's a perfect gentleman. And so he wants us to love him. My, th- my theme tonight is a yoke of burden. A yoke of burden. And, and you'll see that as we continue on. Because God is going to ask Jeremiah, the prophet, to put on a yoke as a, a life illustration for the children of Israel. It says in verse 1, as we begin, in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Joas, king of Judah, his word or this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying. Now, we, we talked about Jehoiakim last week, and we defined who he was. I had looked up in the dictionary and, and found out some information about him, and we established he was a king of Judah in 609 uh, B.C. Uh, he had an earlier name that uh, he used, but then uh, the king, of, or, yeah, the pharaoh of Egypt changed his name to Jehoiakim when it was Alakim in the very beginning, which was God has established, but he was far from living up to that name. Uh, he was pretty much into idolatry and leading the people uh, through his cruelty and so forth. And, and we talked a little bit about him. This is the time where Jeremiah is living. He, he's delivering this message to this king. Uh, and we heard that also it was three months and ten days before Jerusalem fell to Babylon that Jehoiakim actually died at the age of 36. And God says to him, thus says the Lord to me, that is Jeremiah, make for yourselves bonds and yokes and put them on your neck. And so he tells Jeremiah, go and find a smith somewhere and and, and make some bonds, uh, take some straps. And then I want you to take a yoke, uh, which is usually uh, uh, some sort of uh, beams of some sort that they would put together so they could yoke it on an animal. And this yoke was to be made for Jeremiah to wear and just like Ezekiel who was told to do some crazy things as he was supposed to minister to God's people so Jeremiah is giving this life illustration and so you you almost can picture him with this yoke on his back and his shoulders and he's walking around like this you know and say hey Jeremiah what are you doing you gonna go plow some land over there or what why are you wearing that yoke it would be strange right to see someone wearing a yoke to see someone doing something strange, we'd probably ask a lot of questions. And he probably says, no, I'm wearing this because of you. God says he's going to put you under this yoke. It's going to be a burden upon you. You're going to be taken into captivity and you'll be in bondage for 70 years. So you get the picture of Jeremiah wearing that and how it symbolizes the, the fact of God bringing the children of Judah under submission Uh, to this nation, Babylon. And send them to the king of Edom, the king of Moab, the king of Amorites, and the king of Tamir, and the king of Siddim, by the hand of the messenger who comes, who who come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. So Jeremiah was told to send this out to the surrounding kings. Let them know that they will all be taken into captivity. Babylon is a great nation. It's rising. It will come in and pretty much Uh, sweep up everyone with it like locusts just tearing up the land as it goes through and along with Zedekiah who as I said was the last king a yoke of bondage they were going to be given over to Nebuchadnezzar Uh, that's symbolizing that they were in bondage because of what their choices they they chose to worship idols they chose to do what was right in their own eyes. We read that in the book of Judges. I think that's one of the phrases that is used in the book of Judges a lot. They did what was right in their own eyes. They did what was right in their own eyes. And they go to the next judge, and then they did what was right in their own, their own eyes. And then another, God would send another judge, and then they did what was right in their own eyes. What does that phrase mean? They did what was right in their own eyes. In other words, they were ruling over their own life. God wasn't ruling over their life. The church is in trouble. 
because God isn't ruling over our lives. And yet, we are the church, aren't we? We are God's children. We're of a royal priesthood. We're chosen by him. We're called out. We're separated unto him. Boy, God's grace and his mercies and his love towards us. It's amazing to think of where we are and yet you see God's grace poured out upon us. God is amazing. It is amazing love when we think about it. When you think about some of the things that Christians do and and you wonder how God could have so much patience, so much mercy for an individual, but that's the God we serve because he is a gentleman. And we make our choices and God allows us to be separated from him so that we get to a point where we know that it's better to be in the house of my father than to be in a pen with hogs eating up slop. Yeah, it might be hard, but it's a lot better. We get to the point where we're just, okay, that's it. Uh, I've had enough. Uh, I just want to come back to the Lord and just bathe in his love and his grace and know that he has me right in the palm of his hand and that he'll lead and guide me in the direction that I need to go. And I can trust him because he has my best interests. And so I'm not going to go my own way. I'm not going to do what is right in my own eyes. I will follow the Lord from this point on. We have that choice. <clears throat> and so Paul tells us in Hebrews 10, 25, you know, that, uh, or I'm sorry, chapter 12, that he chastises those whom he loves, Right? Because if he didn't chastise us, then there's a possibility that you are not a child of God. And so there is a certain amount of chastisement that comes with our relationship to our God. As I I shared earlier, we'll be hosting uh, How to Raise Godly Children. And and part of raising godly children is correction. Uh, Probably a big part of it is correction. Because of the day that they're born until the day that they leave, well, even when they leave, there's always correction going on with parents and their children, always. From when they're little babies and they're doing things that they don't understand are wrong, but you direct them, don't do that because that's wrong. And so you grab their tiny little hand that's all fat, you know, and chubby little fingers and you go, no, no, no. You know, I mean, you don't, you don't hit them hard. You just go, no, 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 no. What are you doing there? You are training their minds that no, no, no means don't do that. <laughs> you know? And they get it. So the next time they go to do something, you grab their hand and they go, oh, I know what that means. That's no, 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 no. You know? And so we do that. We train our children. We correct them. That's what good parents do. Bad parents leave their children alone to do what is right in their own eyes. That's what happened with uh, Eli and his sons. They offered up uh, evil sacrifices unto the Lord. And then there comes a point when the kids start to understand what they're doing. as, As young children... Quite not sh- there yet, but there is a point where you then say, don't do that. And no longer does the hand work, so now you, you take something and you just swat them on the butt. And they're like, ooh, what was that for? I'm not supposed to do that. You know, then they walk around like this. You know. I'm not talking about beating them, though. I, I understand beating. Believe me, my dad would beat. You know. And so whenever I walked by my dad, I went like this. And I didn't do anything wrong. I was just expecting to get hit. <laughs> you know, so I was always on the alert that dad was going to do something. No, you, you, on the butt. You know, the seat of understanding, as McGee always says there. But it's the correction. It's, it's the correction. And, and as they get into the teenage years, being very firm, stern, and not getting into, as, uh, as um, Dr. Dobson says, you know, you're, you're in the ocean and you're, 
<clears throat> you're on a boat. Both of you are on the boat. This is how he describes teenagers. And, and the teenager jumps into the ocean and the water and he's bouncing all over the place. And he says, don't get in the water with him. You can't get in the water with him because you'll drown together. So, so you stay in the boat and you offer your hand and say, come on, come on. And you get them through it. Uh, and so teenage years is about just getting them through there, keeping them busy. And hopefully they... They will get through it without too much damage. Some of them get a lot of damage and then have some repercussions later on. But usually once they become adults and they realize, wow, my parents really loved me. And there's a point where you realize that of God. Boy, God really loves me that he would correct me, that he would chastise me to bring me back into his arms and into his sheepfold so that I could have that eternal life and that fellowship with him once again. And so God tells Jeremiah in verse 4, command them to say to their masters, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth. I made the earth. You didn't make the earth. You're created beings. I am the creator. The man and the beasts that are on the ground and my great power, by my great power and by my outstretched arm and have given it to whom it seemed proper to me. Uh, that's a God of sovereignty over creation himself. It is God's creation and he can do with his creation as he sees fit. And we see that in Romans chapter one. He created man, he created us and he created us in his image. And so we are to be like him and we're to please him. When you create something, whose is it? You go to school and you take an art class, woodshop class, or you make a drawing. My kids are into the rubber band thing. I don't know what they call it, but they're always making all these, these neat things with rubber bands. It's pretty amazing what they can make with rubber bands. I just saw on Facebook a guy make a gun from Legos, and it shoots Legos, and it's a sniper rifle. And, and the guy had like a... a, a Targets way over there, and he had a sight on it and everything, and he was hitting the targets. It's pretty amazing. Wh whose is that? He created it. And so he can use it when he wants to use it. He can put it up on the shelf if he wants to put it up on the shelf, or he can take it all apart and start all over again because he created it, right? And that's what God is saying here. I'm sovereign. And he's telling the kings of the world, who created man? I did. I am God. And now I have given all these lands into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant. And the beast of the field, I have also given him to serve him. Now when he says that, my servant, and to serve him, he's not saying that, that Nebuchadnezzar is a child of his. He's saying he's using him as an instrument to chastise his children. Not everybody's a child of God. Uh, John makes that very clear in chapter 1, verse 12 that he gave us the right to become children of God. That is, those who believe that Jesus came in the flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, John 14, 1, 14. And so we are children of God because we are born again. But the unbelieving world, they're not children of God. They're creations of God, and God loves them, but they're not children of God. Only those who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. He goes on and, so, and, and says concerning this servant, but yet not a child, as he's using him as an instrument of judgment. So all nations shall serve him and his sons and his sons' sons. And of course, we know that to be 70 years by now until the time of, the land, of this land comes. And then many nations and great kings shall make him serve them. And he's, he, he's talking about the, the Medes and, and the Persians. And you can get to the book of Daniel and you can read all about that and how he has the vision and so forth. Then the Mede and the Persians come and they, they're battling against uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and it shall be, verse 8, that the nations and kingdoms which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation I will punish. That nation I will punish, says the Lord, with the sword and famine and the pestilence until I have consumed them by his hand. And so if you reject this, if you assume that it's not going to happen, then I will just wipe you out. 
I'll send a sword and, and take care of you then. So you might as well accept that judgment is coming and that you will be put under the yoke of bondage and you will serve Nebuchadnezzar. Accept that and go do, and it, it basically we're saying go do your time. Go do your time. Uh, when we would punish the, I don't want to share my whole thing on raising godly children, but when we would punish our boys, it was usually you would do your time. And, and we learned that you had to stick with your guns. Virginia was just sharing a story uh, about Roman and I believe Moses. <clears throat> they were on their way over to go see uh, their grandpa in Rolling Heights. <clears throat> and she kept saying, if you keep it up, you're staying here with dad. And he, she said that Roman also opened his mouth. That's it. Get out. Go. Go. What? No. No. Go. I told you you would stay here with dad. And so she made him stay with, with me. I don't remember the time, but she does. And so she got home, uh, got, got to her parents' house, and her dad said, where's, where's Roman? She says, oh, he wasn't listening. Wasn't being obedient. So I told him, stay home. And her dad looked at her and said, wow, I wish I could have done that. Parents don't usually follow through. They only threaten. You have to follow through so they know you're serious, so they know you love them, that you're going to really correct them. And that's what he's saying here. You have to know where you're going. You're going. So God had determined that all must serve Babylon, whether they liked it or not. And anybody that refused it would be destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar stated that he conquered all the the Hiti country, which is a term used for all the, the Palestinian and the Syrians, and including uh, Judah. And Jehoiakim had been made king of Judah by Necho, which was the Egyptian uh, king or pharaoh. And initially he had to uh, submit to Nebuchadnezzar, but it wasn't until three days, I'm sorry, three years later that, that he actually rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar had come to Jehoiakim and said, you, you need to submit, but he refused to. And it wasn't until three years later that, that he began to try to fight against him. And so Nebuchadnezzar ended up taking Jerusalem and he took uh, Jehoiachin uh, into captivity. Um, he placed him with his uncle, Mathens, uh, where he was then rena renamed. Um, and so they named him Zedekiah, who again rebelled against the king there in Second Kings chapter 25. Nebuchadnezzar's armies besieged the city of Jerusalem and captured Zedekiah. <clears throat> he was brought to Nebuchadnezzar at Riblah, where Zedekiah's sons were slain right before his eyes, again, because he refused to go into this captivity. And he was then blinded. He was bound and then taken captive into Babylon. The temple was looted. It was burnt. The city walls were all dismantled. The city was plundered, and it was uh, pretty much torn down completely. The leading people of the nation were killed and taken also into captivity. It was there that uh, God would kill Zedekiah. <clears throat> now, there were those that were preaching another message. There were false prophets, false priests. Just like we have today, we have false churches preaching other things besides the gospel. And so God told Jeremiah to talk to them. Therefore, do not listen to, the prof to your prophets your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, or your sorcerers who speak to you saying, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. And so they were, they were preaching this, this message of prosperity pretty much in a sense. Uh, this message of, of not condemnation or judgment or you know, a, a friendly message. They, they were pretty much saying, no, 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 king. No, 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 God spoke to us. There's no judgment coming. We're not going to be anyone's slave. Just prosperity. Uh, you know, we're, he's not dealing with sin. Sin, no, there's no sin here. We're doing what we need to do and we need to continue to do that. And they were pretty much lying, lying to him. And that's what we have today. And so we have a lot of confusion over what salvation is. I, I had a call uh, again from my friend Bob, the 86-year-old man and we were talking, <clears throat> and uh, he asked me, because we were talking about salvation, and, and he brought up a point that 
that he finds it strange how people can say they're Christians, but their lives aren't reflecting that. And he wonders if they're even Christians. And he asked me right up front, he says, hey, when were you saved? And I said, January 7th, 1987. He goes, oh, wow. I mean, you, you just, boo, boo, just right out. He goes, I've asked people that, and they're like, well, what do you mean? What do you, when was I saved? Well, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, but when? When did you do that? There has to come a point in time where you are born again, where you know your life has changed, that you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. When was that? And then he told me exactly when it was for him. And it was at a, at a very young, young age in his life. And of course, you go back in history in the early part of the 1900s and you know, Christianity was very much alive. You know, and people were all constantly coming to the Lord. They were closed on Sundays because they went to church and so forth. But see, we live in a day and age now, you ask someone that and they're like, well, who are you to judge me? What does that matter? You know, don't, don't question my salvation. I know God. Yeah, but do you know Jesus? I love what Roman said on, on the video for the upcoming event. To say that you know God is good, but do you know Jesus? And, and if you know, say you know God, but don't have Jesus, you only have a half a truth, and half a truth is, is not truth at all. You've got to have both, God and Jesus. Are you walking with Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Because I know Jesus. Yeah. And I have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you a sinner? Before getting up here, I, I was thinking to myself, wow, <clears throat> I was walking my own way. Some of the things that I used to do, some of the things that I was involved in, and when God revealed to me through, through Matthew chapter five that I was a sinner, and, and it wasn't just the lusting with the eyes. It, it wasn't with the hatred of the heart. When those were two big things in my life at that moment that I was dealing with. But it was more than that. It was the way that I treated my wife. It was the way that I was leading my children. All those things began to come to mind. Reuben, you are missing the mark. You're failing here as a, as a husband, as a father, you know, as a child of God. This is not the direction that I want you to go. And so as he revealed that, I realized how much of a sinner I was and how much I really needed him in my life. It was because of my sin that I had to depend on him. If I would have had to depend on him just for eternal security, which, which is wonderful, without realizing that I was destined to be separated from God for eternity, there would have been no power with it. And I think there comes power when we realize how wretched we are. And here I am, almost, let's see, 1987. So, wow, almost 30 years in two more years. So 20, 28 years later, knowing the Lord, and I'm still a sinner. Now, God never calls Christians sinners, but I know that I'm still a sinner. He provides for us because if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. But he never calls us sinners because, see, God sees us how? Through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's amazing. But yet, in myself, I know my own heart that it can be deceitful and wicked. And I have to deal with that. We have to deal with that in order to understand that God wants a perfect relationship with us. But these liars, these men that teach from the Pope and say, don't worry about your sin. God loves us all, Muslims and gays and just everyone. And, 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 he, and he does love us all. I mean, it's just amazing how the enemy uses truth. He loves us all and you're all fine. That's right there. That's the key. That should be with a little asterisk with the footnote at the bottom. He loves, you're all fine. Not true. <laughs> you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. No, we need to turn from those things and walk with God. So he's talking to these false teachers for they prophesy a lie to you to remove you far from your land and I will drive you out and you will perish. So, so the whole purpose of the lies, the lies of the enemy, the lying to ourselves, because if you read again, 1 John, that second part dealing with our fellowship, there's, there's a point where, where John says, you deceive yourself. We even deceive ourselves. So, so even in the midst of our own deception, 
The whole purpose of all that is what? To separate us from God. And the enemy has all kinds of ways of doing that. If he can give you what you want and it separates you from God, he'll do that. If he can take away things from your life, he'll do that. Now, he's been doing this now for over 2,000 years, so he, he knows man pretty well. And he knows exactly what, what men need. Uh, there's been plenty of me's with, with my characteristics and my personality that have lived throughout history that he has been testing throughout the years. And so he can come to me and say, okay, this is his personality. You know how they, 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 they have personality checks and you type A, type B, type C. You know, I think Satan has the same thing. He's got a chart up there. You know, he tells his, his, his cohorts and says, okay, he's a type C personality. This is what you do. Go do it. And you know, they come back, hey, you're right, he did exactly what you said. Yeah, well, they've been doing it <laughs> since the beginning of time. You know. And it's all to separate us from God. The love of God, the mercies of God. That's where we get in trouble, guys. That's where our relationships fall apart. And, and not just with God, but with one another. <laughs> because it's all connected together. You separate from God, you begin to separate from your marriage partner. You separate from your marriage partner, and you separate from your children. You separate from your children, and you separate from your family. And it just continues on, and it starts to break apart. And yet you're deceived thinking, but there's someone better for me out there. That's a deception and a lie. There isn't someone out there better. The problem is you, not someone else. You need to change. You need to humble yourself and stop believing the lies. You have to come to a point in your life where you say, I don't want to believe that lie anymore. And it's a lie, and, it's a, and I'm not going to believe it. I was listening to Skip today, and he was talking about the, the TV, and he was talking about commercials, and he says, you know how there's some commercials? You say, okay, that, that's believable, and that's, I can understand. But there are some commercials that just outright lie. And he says, lower the volume at that point and start screaming at the TV, liar, liar. He says, your family really think you're crazy. He says, but you need to voice it, liar, you know, that's a lie. And so you have to recognize those lies in, in your life that are from the enemy and just screaming out, lie, that's a lie, I'm not believing that, you know. And you know what happens when you do that and you acknowledge it and you, and you voice it, out the enemy stops using it because he's already oh he, he got that one right well let's try to, we got a hundred other ones to try and we'll just keep attacking but it's not a lie that god would never ever not receive you back there's no point of no return as long as you're breathing he's always there with open arms that's not a lie that's the truth and he's always willing to restore you and pour grace and love on you to restore that relationship. Just like the prodigal son's father. You know, put the robe back on him, restore all everything that he owned, throw a party for him, you know, sacrifice an offering, all of that. That's, a, that's an example of God himself and what he does when one of us returns back to him. But they prophesy lies. But the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the kings of Babylon shall serve him, and I will let them remain in their own land, says the Lord, and they shall till, till it and dwell in it. So again, Jeremiah clearly warned against any prophets that were speaking otherwise than God. And then he was to speak to Zedekiah again. I also spoke to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, bring your neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, serve him and his people, and live. Why will you die, you and your people, by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, as the Lord has spoken against the nations that will not serve the king of Babylon? Therefore, do not listen to the words of the prophets who speak to you, saying, you shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. For I have not sent them, says the Lord, yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I may drive you out, and that you may perish, you and the prophets who prophesy to you. Zedekiah being that last king of Judah is warned by Jeremiah not to believe the lie. 
Also speak to the priests and the people. Verse 16. I sp- also I spoke to the priests and all the people saying, Thus says the Lord, Do not listen to the words of your prophets who prophesy to you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house will now shortly be brought back from Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. And so again, uh, the restoration, God is with us, he's blessing us, kind of a Joel Osteen message, right? I mean, that's exactly what it sounds like. You just have to ask yourself, does the guy read his Bible? <laughs> Go to back to the Old Testament. Read how, how it talks about you, you know, preaching that nice message. And, and you preaching it to a crowd that are not not all believers, and yet, it's amazing how he uses certain words about Christ and God and, you know, and so forth. And so you get this mixture of truth and lies, and it's hard to believe. And so what does that tell us? That we need to be in the Word of God. Yeah? We need to be studying it constantly. And that's why I'm excited about this year, and, and, and somehow I'm praying, and Roman already jumped the gun there and, and, and put it on a, our new bulletin. We're coming up with a new bulletin and he's going to put a weekly reading on there, getting through the Bible in two years and, and it looks pretty simple and you just mark it off during the week, the readings and the next week when you get another bulletin or you get it emailed to you, it's right there and you mark them off and you're on your way to reading the Bible in two years. So that's a neat way of, of doing it. And somehow we're going to figure out how to do it onto the, the website too so that you can get on the website, look up what the reading for the day is, and, you know, so simple. And two years is not too long. I, I think we figured like two chapters one day, one chapter the next. So it's not too much. The two-chapter day, I can kind of see people going, like, oh, that's a lot of words. You know, like my boys would say, I'm tired of reading. <laughs> It's really not a lot of reading. Uh, I, we need to stir up the love of God. And when you stir up the love of God, boy, you just want to keep reading. It just, it's just amazing. So he spoke to the priest <clears throat> that were also liars. <laughs> Do not listen to them. Verse 17, serve the king of Babylon and live. Uh, why should the city be laid waste? You know, so, so endure your correction and live. Take your punishment and live. Verse 18. But if they are prophets, and if the word of the Lord is with them, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts, that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah, and at Jerusalem, do not go to Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, concerning the pillars, concerning the sea, concerning the carts, and concerning the remainder of the vessels that remain in this city, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did not take when he carried away captive Jehoiakim, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from Jerusalem to Babylon, and all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. Yes, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning the vessels that remain in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and of Jerusalem. They shall be carried to Babylon, and there they shall be until the day that I visit them, says the Lord. Then I will bring them up and restore them to this place. Now, notice what he said there. Look, if they are true prophets, then... Let them prove it by interceding on your behalf and then see what God does. I love that. Well, if you're a prophet of God, just pray and let's let God do it. I I remember a story. There was a a gal that used to come to Calvary from YWAM. It was a missionaries group. And she used to go out into um, Africa and into areas where there was literally voodoo, uh, witch doctors and stuff like that. And she encountered, encountered them quite quite often and she has she she had told the story and if i remember it correctly uh, i'll I'll get the main point she tells the story about going into the little village and she would then see this witch doctor dancing around and there was a fire i believe and and just doing all these witchcraft things and 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 spells and incantations and things like that and all of a sudden witch doctor turns to her and starts to say things and immediately she she said 
and she's describing this whole thing, and she's talking about, what am I going to say? How am I going to say it? What am I going to do here? You know, because it was almost like a challenge where he, he challenged her to say something, to do something, to show that, that your God is greater than my God type of thing. It was, a, it was a, a showdown in a sense. And she's like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And the Lord just gave her a word and said, in the name of Jesus, you can't do anything anymore. And that was it. And he just like stopped. That was, that was all that needed to be said. And then he just walked away in the name of Jesus. Look, if your God is great, you know, then if you're with God and, and you're saying that he's with you, then go pray and let's see what God does. But God's not going to listen. You'll be taken into captivity and God's vessels and carts and everything will be taken. And it won't come back until God says when it will come back. What separates us from God is when we decide to walk in our own ways. That itself <clears throat> is a sin and we break fellowship with God. And so we should be at least every day confessing our sins. Lord, forgive me. Restore my fellowship with Every time we do something, Lord, forgive me. Restore my fellowship with you. Why would you want to want to break a fellowship with God? You know? Why would you want to break fellowship with the one who saves your soul? The one who can help you in life itself? You know? Don't do that. Confess your sins and he's faithful and just to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and restore your fellowship with God. Walk in a way where you're constantly fellowshipping with God and confession is a part of that. When I was in the religious religious system of Catholicism, I could only confess my sins on Saturdays. And so we had to wait either Friday or Saturday to go to confession. And so for a whole week, you're living in your sins. You're separated from God. And then you come Saturday and you confess your sins and he tells you to do your little penance and you walk out of the booth and then you sin. <laughs> and now you've got to wait until next Saturday being separated from God before you can have that communion with him again. God is so good that we can come before him every day. Every day. Uh, I wake up in the mornings in, and in my prayers, it's, it's usually when the first thing that I wake up in the morning is like, thank you, Lord, for another day. Sometimes I, I, I say, thank you, Lord. Uh, it would have been nice to go home, but <laughs> I'm here again. <laughs> but I also say, Lord, thank you, and also forgive me, Lord, for my sins. And I start off that way, start afresh and anew every day. And then usually out throughout the day, you start confessing whatever sins that uh, come your way or you bring or deceptions. And at the end of the day, the same thing when you're ready to go to bed. Lord, forgive me for anything I've done today. And God does, and you're restored instantly. That is the truth. 